All right, welcome to part two of the pushing tutorial. So in the last one, we got it set up so that when you walked up to a pushable object, it would recognize that. And so the next thing we need to do here is we need to create the push component itself. So instead of writing all this code inside of the third person character, which you definitely could do, um, we're instead gonna put it inside of a push component so that way you can you know, kind of add it to different characters if you want, or at, at the very least, it's at just kind of um, encapsulated in its own little component. So we'll come back here and we'll just do it right here next to the BP pushable. We'll right click and say blueprint class. And this time we want to select actor component. So go ahead and select that. And we will call this the push component. And so inside of here, uh, let's think what order. Okay, so first of all, let's go to our third person character and let's give him that component. So add component and push component. And the reason we're giving the push component to the character or the player is because, well, he's somebody that can push things. So if you wanna be able to have NPCs that can push things, then they will also need to be able to implement this push component, right? Okay, so back here in our push component, uh, apparently I closed it. Back here in our push component, um, we wanna add a few variables. So over here on the left, we want to add a variable for the current pushable object. So we'll just call it current pushable. And for the type, we will set it to BP pushable, like so. And then we can make this private because nobody else needs access to it. And then we also want to create two more variables for how to determine how we can push things. So we'll make one more here and call it the push speed. And we want to make this a float. And then we can make this blueprint read only. So that way, um, when we make a blueprint read only, it'll make it so that it can't be changed like after runtime. But um, if you go and compile it and you look at the third person character and you click on it, you can see you can set it over here. So it's really nice. So that way you can have different characters being able to push things at different speeds. Um, but by default, let's set it to something other than zero. Let's set it to like 60. And then we also want to add one more float. So add a new variable and call it push range. And this is basically um, how close you have to be to the object in order to push it. And so we'll set this to 120 by default at least. But again, you can always change these values over here on the push component itself if you want to modify them. Okay, so now that we have this set up, we'll, we'll definitely come back here and add stuff to this later, but let's go back to the pushable and we can continue where we left off here. So right now we just have a print string saying, hey, you interacted with this thing, but obviously we wanna do more than that, right? So let's just delete this and then let's add a function over here on the left and we will call this handle interaction. And we can make this private as well. And then we will just go ahead and call this from here. Oops, oops. Call it from the here, sorry. Um, and we wanna pass in the player. So actually let's click on the handle interaction. We wanna add an input parameter. So add an input parameter and call it, or uh, give it the type of third, or Sorry, just give it the type of character, right? Because it doesn't have to necessarily be the player. And then we will call this the character. And we will pass that in like so. So we're basically just handling this uh, event inside of here. And the reason we're doing that is because we're gonna be creating some local variables and you can't create local variables inside the event graph. So it's just kind of an organization thing. But anyways, um, so again, this gets called whenever the player walks up to the box or whatever he's trying to push and he presses the button to push it. So there's a lot of things we need to figure out when he does that. Like we need to we need, we need to figure out first of all, like does he implement the pushable interface? Like is this a valid per person who can push us? Um, you know, is he on the correct side? Is he close enough? Um, is the train pushable? Like there's a whole bunch of things we need to figure out here. So this is kind of what we're going to be doing here. So first thing first is we want to make sure that the character is valid because otherwise, well, I don't know, like <laughs> how did we get this far? if the character is not valid, but we just want to say it is valid because obviously if the character is not valid, then we don't have anybody to push us and things are kind of weird. 
And then we also want to make sure that the person, the person that's pushing us has the pushable component. So drag off this and say get component by class. And we want to search for the pushable component. Uh, or sorry, the push component rather. And then we want to take this and promote it to a local variable. Sorry, yeah, promote to local variable. Make sure you choose local variable. Uh, and when you do that, it'll add a variable down here. If you don't know what local variables are, um, they're basically just variables that are local to this function. So every time the function is called, the local variables get created. And then when the function goes out of scope, they get deleted. And so we want to hook this up here to is valid. And we will call this the push component. And we also want to make sure that this is valid, right? So we'll say is valid. And then as we write this function, we're going to be we're gonna have a lot of these cases where we're checking something to make sure it's valid or checking to make sure that, um, you know, we need to check to make sure a lot of things happen before you can just start pushing something. So in order to kind of help you debug in the future, just in case something goes wrong, um, we're gonna create a macro over here that's going to be used as a print string. And we'll just kind of print out whenever something goes wrong. So each time something fails, we will print out a little error message. So that way when you're running the program or even when I'm running it to show you guys how it works, um, if something, goes wrong, he doesn't push it, we'll be able to see exactly why. So over here on the left, let's just create a little simple macro. So just take a second and we'll just call it push failed um, info, I guess. And so inside of here, we just want to do a print string. Let's say print string and hook that up. And let's drag this in here as well so that can get passed in. And we will call this um, the fail reason. So this is why the why the push failed, basically. Uh, we don't want to print that out directly, though, because we want to append to it. So we can say append like that. And then for, well, let's disconnect that. We want this to be B. And we want A to be um, fail to push, colon, space, and then the fail reason. So it's going to say fail to push, and then it will give us the reason. And then it will continue. And then let's just make this like red or something since it's since it's an error message. Okay, so that way we don't have to like write this every time. So now we can come back here to our handle interaction and we can drag in our push failed info and hook this up here. And so of course, in this case, the reason it failed is because the character was not valid, right? So we can say character is invalid. We can copy this one. And we can say uh, character does not have push component. So this will be really helpful whenever we you know start testing and something's not working correctly, we can quickly see what's going on. Okay, so if we get past all this, then we know we have a character that's valid and he has a push component. And so the next thing we want to do is start figuring out where the closest push transform on the pushable object is. So we haven't really set that up yet, so maybe we should kind of do that real quick first. So the push transforms, uh, if you remember from my other project, let me just run it real quick, or that's not right. Uh, let's just bring this over. The push transforms are these little, these little red arrows, right? So each one of these is a push transform. So you can see this one only has two or one, and it's just it just represents A, where the character stands when he's pushing it, and B, which direction he can push it in. So we want to be able to define those, you know, independently for each pushable object. So back in our viewport, let's just go over here. We want to add some variables, so or just one variable. Um, so hit the variable button, and we will call this the push transforms. And we're going to make this of type transform. And we want to make it an array like so. And then we want to set it to instance editable. So that way we can edit it per instance, right? Because we want different pushable objects to be able to be pushed in different directions. Uh, blueprint read only so it doesn't change after we start the game. Uh, show 3D widget, which is the thing that lets us modify where the position is like in the editor. So I'll show you that in a second. Um, you can check expose on spawn if you want. That just makes it so that when you create an instance of it through Blueprint, you'll be able to uh, specify these. Um, it's probably not that important, but we'll just check it for the heck of it. And then also private, right? Because we, we don't want anybody else modifying this value. So we can compile and save that. 
And so now what we can do is we come back to our world here. If we click on our object, um, because we've said that it's instance editable, you can see it shows up over here on the right and we can hit the plus button. And because we checked show 3D widget, it shows this little 3D widget here. And so we can actually take this, click on it and drag it. So we're actually dragging this little transform itself and we can put it wherever we want. Um, but you'll notice it's kind of hard to tell which direction it's facing if you're not if you don't have it selected because if you select over here you can't tell which direction it's facing right because it doesn't have any arrows associated with it unless you actually click on it like right now we can say okay it's facing it's facing this way to the right but if you don't have it selected it's kind of hard to tell so one thing I did is that in the constructor because you'll notice at my other project um, like you don't have to even have it selected like if we look at these you can see you can see the red arrows themselves if you select it you can see the transforms but if you don't have it selected, like it's still cool because you can see exactly where the transforms are and which direction they're facing, just at a glimpse. Um, so to do that, it's actually really simple. All I did is I just added an arrow component in the constructor. So if you go to the BP pushable and you go to the constructor script, what we can do is we can drag in our push transforms and we can say for each loop. And so for each transform, we want to add arrow component and then this is going to be the relative transform. And so now if we compile and save and we look at our thing in the world, you can see it now has an arrow on it. Um, so the arrow is a little long, so let's make it a little bit shorter so it's not quite so big. Um, so if we go to the construction script again and we click on this add arrow component node, uh, we want to set the length down to like 40. And you can adjust this to be whatever you want, but we compile and save it now we come back and we look so this is how i have it set up in my video that i showed you at the beginning so now it's really obvious that okay this is facing the wrong way so now we can click on it and rotate it 90 degrees and there we go so now it's in the right spot and it's facing the right direction now we might need, we might need to move it like further out or in depending on the animation like we need to make sure it lines up with his hands but we'll just kind of eyeball it for right now and so it's like 150 right here on the y something like that so 150 and then negative 90 is the final value of the transform. Okay, and we'll just stick with this one for right now. So let's go back to our, actually let's add two because it'll be a little bit easier to test. So I'm going to, you can actually hold down alt and then drag and that'll create, okay, maybe not actually, uh, maybe not. Okay, so scratch that. So just click on the box again and then hit this plus button and that'll create a new one. And then you have to click on it here and we can drag it over to the side because we want to be able to push it this way as well. And so I'm going to set this one also to be negative uh, 150, and then I'm going to rotate it so that it's facing the direction we want to push in, like so. All right, so the idea here is that this box will be able to push left and we'll be able to push it to the right, but not forward and backwards. So if we come back here to our BP pushable, and uh, where were we? We were inside of handle interaction, right? Okay, so now that we have our push transform set up, we want to find the we want to find the transform that's closest to our character, right? Because if our character is over here, we want to use this one. Um, but if he's over here, then we want to use this one, right? So uh, the first thing we want to do is say we want to get this character. So we can just right click and say get character. And before we do anything, we actually just want to save his previous transform, and I'll explain how to do this in a in a little bit. But for now, just 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 go ahead and save this. So say get actor transform, and then promote this to a local variable as well. And we'll just call this the um, character pre transform. And again, I'll explain this in a second. I just forgot about that step, but we need to we need to save this because we might need it. Um, but now back to where we were talking about before. We want to find the closest push transform to our character. So we're actually going to make a little function for that over here on the left. And this is going to be where like a lot of our, well, not a lot of it, but this is going to be a, a kind of beefy function. So we'll say find closest push transform index. And so what this is going to do, it's going to return to us the index into this array that has the transform that's closest to the character. So this needs to take in a couple things. It needs to take in the character's location, so new parameter. 
and we're going to make this a vector 2D. And we're using vector 2D here because we don't care about the Z. Uh, we just want to see the character's location on the X and the Y plane. And we'll call this the character location. And then the other thing we want to push or take in here is the push range because we want to make sure that the character is actually close enough to push it. So we'll make this a float and call it the push range like so. And then we can come back here to our handle interaction function and we can hook this up. So we'll say find closest push transform index. Oh, I forgot the return value. We want to also add an output parameter of an integer and we will call this the test index. Okay, so we'll fill out this function in a second, but for right now, let's pass in the parameters. So the character's location is obviously just gonna be the location of the character. So we can say get character, and then we can say get actor location. And I think you can just drag this here, yeah, and it will do the conversion for you. So basically it's just converting it from a 3D location to a 2D location, which is really just getting rid of the Z or the up vector. And so that's that. And then the push range we can get from the push component. So we can drag in our push component from our local variables and say get push range, like so. And then before I forget, because I did skip this earlier because we didn't have the push component. Um, so this push range, we also want to use this in the third person character where we hard coded that, that value. So real quick, let's go back to the third person character and here where we put 120, we actually want to use that push range. So drag in the push component and say get push range. And that way we're not using just random numbers everywhere. We're actually using good numbers. Okay. Uh, so back here, find closest push transform index. And so uh, again, we'll come back and write this in a second, but Let's just keep going a little bit further here and then we'll write it. So this best index, again, it's an index into this push transforms array for which one we wanna use. So we wanna make sure that this index is, um, is valid. So we wanna make sure that it's greater than or equal to zero because um, we're gonna make it so that if it doesn't find one that's valid, it's going to return negative one. So if it's greater than or equal to zero, let's do a branch to check that then what we want to do, well, first of all, if it's not, let's print out a little error. So let's just copy this macro and hook it up here. And we'll say uh, no push transform found. Um, but if it's true, then we want to, uh, well, for right now, let's just draw a debug sphere so you can see where it's finding it. So we'll say draw debug sphere and hook that up to the true. All right, so we want to take the push transform that this returns, and we want to convert it from relative space into world space, right? Because these, these push transforms, if you look at the values of them, like over here, these push transforms are in relative space, right? Like 0, 150, 0 for the location, that's in relative space. like. That, that doesn't move if I move this box, right? It's, it's relative to the box. It's 150 units to the right of the box. So the, these transforms are in relative space to the box. They're not in the world space, but we need the world space position of them. Um, so to do that, well, first of all, let's get, let's get the transform, first of all. So I'm gonna make a reroute out here. And this is the index we wanna use. So drag in our push transforms and say, get a copy and hook that up. And so that's going to get push transform of the one that we're closest to. And we want to do something called, I think it's called, well, it's just multiply. You're just multiplying two together. But if you, if you search for the multiply, the asterisk sign, you'll get this um, composed transform node. And what that does is it basically just multiplies two transforms together. And when you do that, it puts uh, one transform in the space of another transform. And so we want to put it in the space of the actors transform. So it goes to world space. So you can say, uh, get actor transform, which is the transform of the box, right? And so we're multiplying these together. So it's taking the relative position and putting it into world space. And we want to split this node here. And we want to, well, I guess we could just, yeah. So for starters, let's just, let's recombine this actually. So you can see what's going on. So let's just take this, um, Oh, sorry, actually, let's split it uh, and hook this into the center because I just want to show you guys like what's happening because I know it might be a little confusing. And we'll bump this radius down to like 20 and then 
we'll set the duration to two, thickness to one, and we'll like make it red or something. Um, so right now it's not gonna do anything, right? Because uh, this function isn't written yet. But as soon as we write that, what you'll see is you'll see a little sphere that draws at the location of that transform. So, so the last thing we need to do here is we need to write this little function. So let's come inside of find closest push transform. And again, what we wanna do is we want to look at the different transforms, which again are these things here, and we wanna figure out which one's closest to the player. So to do that, um, we wanna loop over our transforms. So drag in our transforms and say for each loop, like so. And we wanna just go ahead and split this node. And we wanna take this array index and we wanna promote it to a local variable. And we will call this the current transform index and hook that up to the loop body. So we just wanna cache that basically. And then the next thing we wanna do is we want to take this location, which again is in, uh, it's in relative space and we wanna transform it or move it into world space. So we'll say get actor transform and we'll say transform location. And of course the location we wanna transform is this guy. Just add a little reroute node here. And then we wanna take that and we wanna make it into a vector 2D because again, we don't care about the Z when we're calculating the distance between these things. So we'll say vector 2D. Um, yeah, two vector 2D. And then we wanna drag off this and we wanna calculate the distance between the transform and the character. So we'll say distance 2D. And you'll notice when you type distance 2D or, or any type of distance, it's gonna give you two options. It's gonna give you one that's just the distance and then it's gonna give you another one that's the distance squared. Um, and just to really quickly explain if you don't already know. So the distance formula requires that you take a square root. Um, and for computers, like relatively speaking, it's kind of expensive to do square roots. So generally people like try to avoid them if they can, but it's not like a huge deal. But for the distance formula, it's definitely something we can avoid doing because obviously before you take the square root of something, it's the same value, but it's squared. So if we take the distance squared, it's just a little bit of an optimization we can do so that the computer doesn't have to do a square root. Um, and since we're just comparing distances, we don't actually care about the actual distance, it's fine because you know, even if it's squared, if you're just comparing it to another value that's squared, it's still gonna be higher or lower if you take, even after you take the square root of it. So. Um, the distance we want to compare it to is the character's location, which is passed in. So we can just drag off of this and say get character location, like so. And then we can take this and promote this to a local variable as well. And we will call this the current distance. And I'm going to put SQ here just so we can remember that it's, it's squared and it's not the actual distance. And we'll hook this up. And so what we wanna do is we wanna check if this distance is the shortest one. Well, well first of all, we wanna check if this distance is um, shorter than our push range, right? Because if it's if it's out of our push range, then we don't care anyways, because it's too far away to push. So uh, we can also use our push range here. So we can just say get push range. And we wanna check if this value is less. So we'll say float less. Um, but since this is a squared value, we also need to square this so that the way they're relative to each other. So we can just square it. And squaring something is very, very quick. So it's not a big problem at all. And make sure you get square, not square root, because um, obviously those are different. And then do a branch here. Okay. And so now we want to check if this current distance is the shortest distance that we've encountered, or we want to check if this is the first distance that we've encountered because basically like we're looping over all of these red uh, arrows or these these transforms right so we're, we want to see like is this one the closest because if we start if our character starts here and we check this one first then this one's going to be the closest but then when we come to this one on the right like it's obviously going to be the closest so we need to keep updating which one's the closest whenever we find a new closer one so what we can do is we can say um is our current distance squared? We want to know if it's less. So we'll say float less than. We want to know if it's less than our best distance or our closest distance. So we need to make a little variable for that over here on the left. And we will call this the closest distance squared. 
And then this needs to be a float and a single type, like so. And we'll hook that up. And so if it's less than that, uh, and, or sorry, or, or if it's the first one that we've encountered. So we also want to keep track of our um, closest transform index. So we'll add another variable and say closest transform index. And we'll make this an integer here. And I'm just going to rearrange this one. I'm going to drag this one above so you can see what we have here. So you can see we have current transform index and current distance. And then we have closest transform index and closest distance. So we have the currents and the closest, right? The, the, the current is the one we're currently on in the loop, and the closest is the best one we found, basically. So we want to say if our closest transform index is less than zero, meaning we haven't found one yet. And so since we're doing this, we want to make sure that we default this value. So if you click on this value, we want to make sure that we default it to negative one. So that way, the first time it hits this, this will be true. All right, so we're just basically checking if this is the best one. So we do a branch here. And if it is the best one, then we want to update our closest to be our current. So we'll say closest, and we'll set that to our current. And we'll do the same thing for the distance. We'll say closest, and we will set that to our current. And then for this return node here that I've been kind of dragging along, uh, we want to actually take this and drag it back over here to the completed. And so when it's complete, meaning that it's looped over every single one of the transforms that you've added, we want to return the closest one that we found. So we'll return our closest transform index like so. So just to kind of recap here, and then we'll run it so you can see that it's working. Um, all this function is doing is just looping over the transforms, which again are just those like red arrows, the locations of them. It's looping over those locations. Um, it's taking the location and it's converting it into world space. And then it's comparing how, how close that um, that arrow thing, that transform is to the actual character. It's saving that value. And then it's checking that that value is less than the push range, meaning is it close enough to the character so you can push it? If it is, then it's checking if that current distance is less than the closest distance that we found so far. I think I found, I think I spoke closest wrong. Did, closest. Um, or if it's the first one, if it is, then we update our closest transform index and our closest distance squared to whatever our current values are. And then we just go ahead and return that. All right, so now if we run this, we should see this working if we did everything correct. So we press play, come over here and I press my F key. You can see it draws that little red sphere there and that's actually the location of our push arrow. And you can see it's drawing the one closest because if we come over here, it's gonna draw this one now. And if we're somewhere like here, well, we're not quite close enough to it yet. So there, we have to be close enough to it. So basically when that red circle gets drawn, that means that we are close enough to that transform to start pushing from that angle. So once we have the code written, if we were to press F right here, we would start pushing the box uh, away from us, right? And you can test this out by adding more transforms if you want, but I think two is probably good for right now. Okay, so the next thing we wanna do here, let me just run my other one real quick and show you something. Because you'll notice if I come over here and I push this, like pay attention to where that little red circle spawns on this one. Oh, that didn't work, that's not, oh, I forgot, I removed it. You can see it spawns at my origin. You can see, I can't really show you, but you see that little red circle kind of at my hip level? So it's not actually spawning on the ground, it's actually spawning at my hips. And I'm doing that because I'm using that to set the location of the character. Whenever you set the location of the character, you're really setting the location of where his hips are because the character's origin is at his hips. So um, what we wanna do is we want to move that red circle up to his hips. So back in the event graph, or sorry, back inside of handle interaction, um, this is where we're drawing that little red circle at. What we wanna actually do um, before we draw it or use it, well, we'll keep this draw here just so we can visualize it. We wanna take, um, we wanna take this location and we want to add half of his character's capsules half height to it. So I'm just gonna unhook this real quick. And we can say get character. And we'll say get capsule component. And then from there we can say get scale capsule half height. And then we want to add this location. So we'll drag off this location, we'll say vector plus vector. 
And we only want to add to the Z, so we'll just split this. And then the Z value that we want to add to is this half height. And that's going to be our new center. So now if we draw this, you can see the red sphere will draw at his half height right at his hips, which is what we want. So this value of where the red circle is, that transform, um, we want to save that because that's the location we want to teleport the character to or move the, the, move the character to whenever he starts doing a push. So let's do it right before this draw debug. So let's make a little variable over here on the left again, and we will call this the character new transform. So we'll say character new transform. And by new, I mean it's the his new location once he starts pushing. It's where we're gonna where it's where we're gonna move him to. So we want to make sure this is a transform. And we want to take this, say set, and we want to move this here, and then we can split this. So this is going to be the location. Bear with me. Uh, and then the rotation and the scale, we want to drag these in as well. And I'm gonna add some reroute nodes so we can clean this up a little bit. And then you can hopefully see a little better what's going on. Yeah, so that's basically the gist of it. So we're just taking this transform and we're just modifying that one Z value in it and then we're setting it to our character's new transform. And then just so we can still visualize it, we can split this up and continue to print out the center point. So let's just make sure we didn't mess that up. So there you go. So it's still drawing at the correct spot no matter which side uh, we go on. Okay. So that's our first step. Um, the next thing we need to do, well, maybe we should go on to part three because this one's kind of getting long. So this is actually a pretty good place to stop. So I'll see you guys um, in part three then.